it's a great pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, I was reading, as we were repeating the affirmation, I, I like to stop occasionally and think about words that we habitually repeat. How can you not feel comfortable and wonderful in a place, in a church that says, love, love is the doctrine of this church, the quest of truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. That's a wonderful thing, and think how many places that you attend in life routinely where those basic statements of fundamental values are not present. Uh, so I'm very, very glad to be here. I will warn you in advance that my wife Joanne is sitting on the third row. We have we have an agreement. If I run overtime, she's supposed to wait. <laughs> okay. I, I I am accustomed to speaking for 50 minutes at a time on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, <laughs> and an hour and 20 minutes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So it's always of peril. The topic of my presentation is issues that, abide, that divide us, the Supreme Court and affordable health care. So I'm going to be talking about the recent decision of the United States Supreme Court, but that can be, I know, terribly, terribly dry, and the subtext of the word dry is boring. <laughs> So I want to be careful not to make this subject either dry or boring, and I will do this by talking about a few vignettes involving real people and real incidents in our history. Okay. So issues that divide us. We have been divided since the beginning of the Republic by federalism. Have you thought about that? There are countries in the world that are not federal. France is the most prominent example where everything is centralized in Paris. We're a federal republic. We had founding fathers in 1787 who insisted, think about this now, the primary units of government in the lives of people of this country would be state and local. And the federal government was regarded as a distant and possibly alien, possibly threatening force. Think about that. Do you want your primary government? This is bias, I'll admit. Let's, okay. Do you want your primary government? <laughs> Those who decide the issues that affect your daily lives to be made by leaders of the city of Fort Worth? Do you want to live in that place? Do you want Fort Worth to be the primary government that decides most everything about your lives? Do you want those decisions to be made by the Fort Worth ISD? Do you want those decisions to be made by the state of Texas? <laughs> I said it was biased. I said it. The, the problem with federalism has always been where you are living, and we live in Texas. Now, I know that's perilous, because I don't live enough on Texas. I think I am, in fact, part of a family that has been in Texas for seven generations. I tried to escape for a while, but I came back. So, if when I lived in Wisconsin or in Maryland, I might have felt quite differently about having the state government be the primary government. So the question is, when you live in Texas, do you want the state of Texas, the city of Fort Worth, the Fort Worth ISD, to be your primary government? Okay? Now, your alternative, do you want the federal government? Do you want the national government? We think of the national government as being in Washington, but it actually is a very pervasive government. We spoke at forum this morning about the Bureau of Prisons and the Women's Health Facility at Carswell. Health, it goes in quotes in this instance. And we saw that the Bureau of Prisons is not a caring, compassionate, and concerned institution. And 
I've been working at Carswell and various, along with Reed, Bills, and others for a number of years. I know for the past 15 years at least that it has been a very, very insensitive place. So do you want the government in Washington, D.C., or wherever it may be, to the primary, primary government? Now, I'm going to go back in history now for the warning. Another way to think about this is to think of two people. Thomas Jefferson. We think of Thomas Jefferson ordinarily in a very positive sense because of the Declaration of Independence and perhaps because of the separation of church and state. Thomas Jefferson believed that the primary government in your life should be state and local government, and he regarded the national government as an alien force. Would you like to live in Thomas Jefferson's world? Let me, let me, let's talk about this. Think about it vividly as part of your life. Would your primary life, the primary people affect your lives, be the local grocery store, the local pharmacy, the local banker, the local hardware store, where you knew all of those people, where you probably trusted them, or if you had had interactions with them, you, you knew that they were not to be trusted. So would you like to live in that kind of community? I would. I would. Okay. Ask yourselves the important question, does that world still exist? And the answer is probably not. It may exist some places, but you would have to go perhaps far into what I would call the hinterland <laughs> of West Texas <laughs> to a very, very small community where you might find a village or a town that would still be like that. So that was Thomas Jefferson's view. Or would you prefer the view of Alexander Hamilton? Alexander Hamilton believed in a strong national government that would be sufficient to meet the problems of the country. He went he was involved in banking and trade and finance and all of that. So that sounds, in certain respects, pretty good and pretty positive. But think about that as well, because the strong national government that Alexander Hamilton favored has also given us, given us what we call the imperial presidency. They didn't intend it that way, but it has become that way. And that means we have a presidency in the United States that is largely uncontrolled by law or by accountability. Now, you may like a certain president and think that that's okay, but sometimes there is bound to be, or perhaps has been already, a president that you didn't feel terrific. <laughs> <laughs> that you didn't want to have that kind of unbounded power, okay? I pose that we got Jefferson, Hamilton, we got upside, we got downside. Here's the underlying constitutional problem. It's been a problem since 1787. The Constitution was designed so that your primary government would be the state of Texas. The primary government responsible for the promotion and protection of your health, education, safety, and welfare would be your state government, not the national government in Washington. The national government in Washington, according to the original constitutional design, was not a government that had the power to protect your health, education, safety, and welfare. The national government did not have that power. That was not the original design. In this sense, conservatives are correct. The original understanding of the Constitution was the, the understanding of Jefferson and James Madison. And the national government has only those powers which are delegated to it in our Constitution. Actually, in one section of the Constitution. Article 1, Section 8, I know that sounds boring, but Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution says that the national government shall have power to regulate commerce among the several states. It also says that it shall have the power 
to tax and spend for the common defense and the general welfare of the people of the United States. So the theory is you have to find the power enumerated somewhere in the Constitution. So the SCOTUS, Supreme Court of the United States, short term SCOTUS, the SCOTUS had to decide whether the national government had the power to enact the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. A decision in that regard was inescapable. Now, I'm sure that you've heard by now that there were five votes of the nine justices that sustained the individual mandate, but it sustained it not the way that most of us expected it to be sustained if we did, not under the interstate commerce power, but under the taxing and spending power. So that brings me back to the case. I'm going to do this with a couple of very, very simple vignettes. The first time I'm going to, first case I'm going to talk about comes from 1824. And you're like, oh my God, a long time ago. It involves something very simple that you learned about probably in elementary school, which for me was long ago. It may have been long ago for many of you. It involved Robert Fulton's steamboat. 1824, the Supreme Court had to decide whether the state of New York would have the power to regulate traffic, steam traffic, steamboats on the Hudson River or whether that was the power of the national government. And they had to decide that in 1824. Now listen, this is really, really simple. The court said in 1824, interstate commerce, that commerce that is within the power of the national government, involves commerce, here's the crunch, quotes, commerce that affects more than one state. Think about that. Think what that meant in 1824. Think what a vastly different thing that meant in 1824 than it means now, because most of the things that occurred in 1824 did not affect more than one state. They were in fact local, county-wide, regional-wide, but not in big states like Texas, not affecting more than one state. But all we have to do is take that language from 1824 and run it forward to our time. Now ask yourself the question, how much does everything that you do commercially the markets that you're part of, your mortgage, your insurance, your health care, how much of that affects or involves more than one state? And the answer is simple. Almost everything you can think of affects more than one state, which means all we have to do is take the decision of 1824, run the clock forward to now, and the Affordable Care Act is Constitution. Step one, okay? Step two, I'm going to talk about Roscoe Filburn. You ever heard of Roscoe Filburn? Roscoe Filburn had a farm near Dayton, Ohio. Okay? And his case came to the Supreme Court in 1942. Roscoe Filburn had accepted payments from the federal government that guaranteed the price for a bushel of wheat that was grown on his farm. But he decided even though he was limited on what he could plant in exchange for that price guarantee, because otherwise every farmer would plant everything they could in the country and get a price guarantee for it, Roscoe Filburn decided to grow some extra wheat, which violated his contract with the national government. Okay. So he said, before the Supreme Court, or his attorney said, I fed all the grain that was extra beyond my allotment, I fed it to my family, or I fed it to my livestock. The Supreme Court in 1942 said, okay, you only have a 95 acre farm in Dayton, near Dayton, Ohio, but what if every farmer like you in the country planted extra crops and grew extra grain and consumed it the way you have consumed it. The court said, and here's another 
want to put in the book, the cumulative economic effect of what you're doing affects everybody, but it because it affects the national market for grain. And therefore, the Supreme Court said in 1942 that the cumulative economic effect of your activity makes you in interstate commerce and brings you under the power and the authority of the United States national government. So we don't we only need two things to answer this question. We need the decision from 1824. Whatever you do that affects more than one state is interstate or the cumulative economic effect of your activity. Uh, everybody added together makes it national power. Okay, now that sounds perhaps uninteresting or unimportant, but let's run it forward to when it made a difference. Let's talk about the Civil Rights Movement. The Civil Rights Movement was, to a large degree, a spontaneous movement launched by a lot of leaders, especially the famous ones that you've heard of all your life. But there is a limit to what movements of people can do, you need legislation. So, to everybody's amazement probably, Lyndon Johnson became the civil rights president. You ever thought of him as the civil rights president? He was. We passed the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which John F. Kennedy could not get through Congress. Lyndon Johnson got it through Congress in a variety of probably reprehensible and sometimes <laughs> disgusting matters. <laughs> he used his power, let's say, assertively. Okay. So we had two cases that came out of that, both in 1965. So I'm going to talk about the Heart of Atlanta Motel, and I'm going to talk about Ollie's Barbecue in Birmingham, Alabama. We heard Roscoe Filburn. She's waiting at me already. Okay. I'll be quick. I'm just about done. Okay. Okay. So, the Heart of Atlanta Motel said, we're just a single side motel. We're not part of a chain. You know. So, that didn't apply to us. So, if we want to discriminate against people, we can do the, you know, the old no shirt, no shoes, no service kind of thing, but they meant no African Americans. We can do that because we're a single site and we're not in interstate commerce. And the Supreme Court said in 1965, where do your visitors stay? Where do they come from? Where do they come from? If you want to run a motel and claim you're not in interstate commerce, you have to sign a sign over the desk that says, you only get to stay here if your trip began in Georgia and ends in Georgia, and no business can survive that way. So I'll be quick. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Let me talk about Ollie's Barbecue. Ollie's Barbecue in Birmingham, Alabama. You all have been figuratively to Ollie's Barbecue at some point in your life. You know, remember the, the ones that used to use old discarded school desks? that were around the end. You had a little plastic thing you had your barbecue sandwich in. It was a greasy spoon, in other words. <laughs> there was one right by the cotton exchange where I worked when I was in high school. Ollie's Barbecue said, I'm just a local place running lunch. I can discriminate against whoever I want to because I'm not part of interstate commerce. And the Supreme Court said, where did your barbecue come from? Where did those little red plastic baskets we put the greasy paper in. Where did those come from? Where did your school desk come from? Anything that you use that has been involved in the flow of commerce makes you involved in interstate commerce. And therefore, the national government has the power to prohibit discrimination based upon race. We started with race. You know now that we have included under the civil rights legislation of the federal government race, creed, color, previous condition of servitude, religion, a variety of other things, and we're verging eventually with perhaps a different Congress and perhaps a different president, we're verging toward sexual orientation and other categories 
that will be prohibited under civil rights legislation. Okay? Now, surprise, surprise, that is not how the case was decided. This, a majority of the Supreme Court could have voted with all this precedent. The interstate commerce power is sufficient to sustain the mandate, but they didn't do it. They didn't do it. There were four votes for that. Five votes said, no, we have to take a different view of the power of the national government under interstate commerce, okay? And that is still lurking in the background of what may come in the future, whether or not those limitations will be taken seriously. But the Chief Justice, who had to be sensitive to the needs of the institution which he headed, the federal judiciary and the Supreme Court, he crossed over and upheld the mandate under the power to tax and spend. Guess what? That's been around since 1937, when we created legislation that required uh, compensation, work, workman's compensation systems under state law. The power to tax and spend for that purpose has been around and upheld by the Supreme Court in 1937. So it's not surprising that the Supreme Court upheld the Affordable Care Act. Not surprising, it's a little surprising they did it under tax and spend, but we've been there before. So the question is, where will we go from here? Let me tell you quickly, and I will stop. Your voice must be fast. Okay. <laughs> I know I'm out of time, but I'll where, where, where do we go from here? Well, it depends a lot on who gets elected president again and who the next justices of the Supreme Court will be. But let me tell you, even though we have had one constitution since 1787, we in fact have had different constitutions according to the times in which we live. We have been living with a constitution that was largely created in the New Deal, especially about decisions between 1937 and 1942. There are probably five votes on the Supreme Court at present to change that, to create a, const a new constitution, which will mean that you or I, you can weep if you want to at this point, you and I will probably have to live our lives relying more on the state of Texas and the city of Fort Worth and the Fort Worth ISD than we ever have before because I suspect there will be limitations upon the power of the national government. But the other side of this is it may be that the material aspects of technology and wealth money and how we transfer power and money around the country will be such that they will overwhelm that possibility. But it still depends a lot on who wins the next election and who the next justices of the Supreme Court may be. I'm supposed to say at this point, as we rise in the body of our spirit.